What's up, Z Package, your boy Z Dog MD. Okay, today I have a harrowing tale that recently was in the press from a European anesthesia conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. And the story that was told was so, it was simultaneously terrifying and also weirdly encouraging that we may be doing something right, but then again terrifying that we're doing something terribly wrong and we really just don't understand what the heck we're doing in terms of CPR and resuscitation. The story goes like this. I'm gonna tell the tale. I'm gonna go back and talk about a case report from 2017 in the EMS literature. And then we're gonna talk about the ethics and the logistics of what we can do better for resuscitation and CPR. So it goes like this. There's a 69 year old guy having some days of indigestion, comes into the hospitals, kind of short of breath, he gets into the hospital, the paramedics are still in the room, he's there in the hospital, this is in Europe, cardiac arrest, loses consciousness, they put on the leads on him and he apparently, from what I can glean from the case report, uh, that through filtered through the press and through Science Daily and some other sites, is that he had no electrical activity. So it was a asystole. So immediately, since he's there in the room, the, the paramedics and some hospital staff take turns doing really high quality CPR on him. So immediately, by the way, the wife is there. So according to the story. So they're doing, when I say high quality CPR, it means our latest understanding of what CPR is. Now remember, 12% of people in the outside world out of hospital survive cardiac arrest with CPR. In hospital, it's two to three times higher because you have all the staff there, you have the drugs, you have the defibrillator, everything's there. And presumably people are better trained. You're not just dealing with a bystander. So this being said, they immediately do high quality CPR, which is this, good deep compressions, about two inches on the adult, about 100 to 120 compressions per second. So roughly ushers, yeah. <laughs> right? They're doing that. And the, the next piece of that of high quality CPR is that you don't stop. So really, really, really avoid any interruption in CPR. So they do that. The third piece is the ventilation piece. You know, if you're out on the street, they say if you're not trained, you don't have to do any mouth to mouth or rescue breaths. If you are trained, then, you know, a couple rescue breaths every 30 compressions or so. But it's it's less crucial, it's more crucial, especially if you're bag masking or otherwise ventilating, that you don't overventilate because then you fill the lungs and you decrease the efficacy of the chest compressions because you're no longer allowing the heart to fill and, and appropriate blood flow. The other thing about high quality CPR, and again, this is important to the story because this may be what has changed because we never used to see this phenomenon really, at least obviously before, and now we are. And we're gonna talk about what the phenomenon is because it's terrifying. So. When you do the compression, you have to allow a full recoil of the chest so that you're squeezing blood out, but then you're recoiling, creating that, that uh, sort of vacuum effect and allowing the heart to fill. So high quality compressions, 100 to 120 per minute, about two inches deep, don't stop, ventilate, but don't overventilate. okay. So far, so good. Now, of course, all the other stuff about putting on uh, AED or a defibrillator, checking a rhythm, doing the appropriate ACLS, the advanced cardiac life support, out of the scope of this discussion. But suffice it to say, all of that was done. Now, here's what's amazing. They do CPR, okay? He has no pulse, no blood pressure. They do CPR. The dude wakes up, starts moving his head, moving his arms, apparently verbalizes a bit. His wife is there by the bedside holding his hand. When they stop, so of course, the typical scenario is if someone wakes up and starts interacting, you stop CPR because you presume they have return of spontaneous circulation. A lot of studies show that you're only getting about 15% of your normal blood circulation with CPR, and it's not enough to perfuse brain and get brainstem reflexes, spontaneous breathing, all those other things, just from CPR. It's a sort of minimal viable circulation to keep you from, your, from brain death, but not enough to wake you up and have you be like, what up, homie? Well, this guy, he's aware by all sort of measures. And when, so they stop CPR, which is appropriate. And what happens? He's out again. They do it again. CPR, he wakes up, moving, interacting a little bit. 
They stop CPR. He's out again. So it seems pretty clear, especially from the rhythm strip, the lack of a pulse, that it is the CPR that is providing enough circulation, at least in addition to whatever else is going on, that is allowing him to perfuse his brain and wake up. Now, let this settle in for a second. Our classic understanding of cardiac arrest is people are unconscious, unaware, and technically dead. And you are just sort of kind of preserving what you can until you can get a definitive treatment, which is usually uh, either defibrillation, cardiac uh, drugs like epinephrine, amiodarone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the whole life support protocol. Well, or a surgical intervention, or if it's tamponade, putting a needle in, treating the underlying cause. Well, in this case, he has enough circulation. Now, before we go on, is this precedented? Well, it turns out when you talk to CPR survivors, right, the 12% who survive outpatient and the higher percentage that survive inpatient, about one to two percent of them actually report clear memories or at least memories of being resuscitated. So of the compressions of details of the resuscitation of what people said, that sort of thing. So the level of awareness may be higher than we've thought, especially with high quality CPR because you're getting better circulation. So immediately you start to think, oh crap, because those of us who do this, right, either as a hospitalist, emergency doc, paramedic, nurse, anesthesiologist, right? We assume that patient is dead. They're not feeling anything, etc. We may be wrong, at least in a percentage of cases. And we may be increasingly wrong as we get better CPR. Okay, so this happening, by the way, I want you to leave in the comments if you've had experience with this, if this has happened to you, or if you've had patients who have, ex have shown this experience, because we see case reports, they're very rare. What if it's more common and people just aren't reporting it, okay? So I want you to tell me in the comments. All right, that being said, this keeps going. So they're doing compressions for 90 minutes. Now in the process of this, he's getting epinephrine, he's getting really good ventilation, so I think they ultimately intubated him. Um, and during this course, you know, his oxygen sats are 100%, so he's getting, decent oxygenation, possibly ventilation, and there's enough BP that he's aware. Wife is holding the hand, team is talking to him. Whenever they stop, poof, out go the lights. They do ultrasound of his heart. There's no heart activity outside of CPR. They do a more definitive ultrasound, I guess, and I'm trying to piece this together from the limited information that's available publicly, and they see evidence of a big aortic dissection. Well, they've been going now 90 minutes. They consult multiple thoracic surgeons, uh, presumably by phone. They go through all this uh, effort, right, the resuscitation team, and they realize that probably he's not going to survive a surgery and that this is ultimately going to be a futile uh, affair. Now, I don't know what the family's input was, what the wife sitting there at the bedside, but apparently the attending physician who presented this case said that, he was in a position of telling the patient at 90 minutes, we're sorry, we can't save your life. And having that patient be aware when they stop CPR and the lights go out. Now think about that for a second, all right? Have we ever really been put in that position either as a family, as a patient, or as a caregiver doing CPR? And apparently it deeply affected everyone at that scene and again, I'm not going to second guess their decision making because they made that decision clearly after exploring all the avenues. The standard CPR time is around 20 minutes. Most uh, There are some studies that say you ought to go 40 minutes or 45 minutes to give it the best chance. These guys went 90 minutes, so double that, and ultimately have to make this decision where they stop. The patient is aware, right? So suddenly we've opened up this horrific ethical dilemma. Because our CPR has gotten better, we can now potentially actually provide enough circulation that people are aware during CPR. Now, let me rewind for a second. And by, by the way, so after the patient died, uh, they did an autopsy and he had a massive aortic dissection that it was clear with the retrospectoscope he would not have survived a repair. So they made the correct decision, but that doesn't make it any less hard. I mean, even thinking about it makes me really, I mean, it's terrible. So 
So let me rewind for a second and tell you about a case in 2017 in the EMS literature where it was a younger guy, 52, had a, um, a cardiac arrest at home, family heard him. <laughs> so this was an out of hospital cardiac arrest, okay? Paramedics show up, this is in Canada, I think it was Ontario. Paramedics show up, do really high quality CPR. They defibrillate him eight times. Every time they start doing CPR, he starts thrashing and punching and kicking at them, trying to get them to get them to stop. When they stop, he's out like a light again. So here's a frontline EMS situation where they're actually put in danger because they're clearly hurting the guy by doing aggressive, high quality CPR on him by shocking him. And yet he, he's, he's fighting but yet they have to save his life. So listen to the end point of this one. They end up eight shocks, they end up doing uh, double defibrillation, they get another set of paramedics come in, they're on the phone to central command, whatever that's called in EMS world, and they uh, uh, end up doing uh, Versed to sedate him a little bit, finally, because that's all they have on the rig. They don't have you know, propofol, they don't have ketamine, they don't have atomidate on this rig, and so, the guy apparently gets more calm. They get him to the hospital to a cath lab where they open up a 100% left anterior descending coronary artery occlusion. He survives, has no neurologic sequelae, and is discharged 72 hours later. Now, this guy probably remembers a lot of what happened. And if you think about that, first of all, his life was saved. Wow it almost went the other way because he was so aggressively fighting because he's perfusing enough to feel the horror of having chest compressions and electric shocks without sedation. And so to wrap this up, what that says is this now raises a couple of questions. One, we've gotten really good at CPR. Still not great, but it's much better than it was. Number two, should we be sedating patients in a way that doesn't compromise their hemodynamics? So something like ketamine, and what's the dose? Nobody knows. There are no algorithms for this. There are no protocols for awareness during CPR. There now need to be. So we can take these increasing number of sort of at least anecdotes and cases and start to translate, we need a clinical practice. Now here's a deeper, more difficult question. How many of our patients are aware during CPR at a minimum level of all the horrors that are happening to them? but don't remember or can't express what they're feeling because they don't have that much perfusion. This is terrifying. It reminds me of the movie, The Serpent and the Rainbow, where they gave him that chemical that paralyzed but didn't sedate him and buried him alive and put a bunch of spiders on him. And there he is unable to move, unable to talk under six feet of earth in the dark with spiders on him until someone digs him out and he wakes up. That is a very analogous situation so it makes us think, should we develop protocols for sedation? Should we consider this the equivalent of uh, anesthesia awareness during surgery? Do we think about the PTSD component of somebody who survives CPR, if they remember this? Do we think about the PT PTSD component of the team caring for that patient who they're watching him awake during CPR? Like think about the team in Europe that was taking care of this gentleman who ultimately died and they had to tell him that, that they were stopping. These are the questions we need to ask. And we not just ask, but we need to answer these questions. And smarter people than me are gonna have to powwow all you guys, people who do this every single day on the front lines and come up with protocols that will work to address this. It also really speaks to the resiliency of the human mind and awareness and consciousness that this is able to happen when the perfusion is so minimal. And it really makes you think about what's a minimal viable sort of brain function. Um, and you know, I'm going to read one comment here. Michael Riga got, caught my attention. Think about Johnny Got His Gun and Metallica made a song about it. So Metallica's video one was based on Johnny Got a Gun. Uh, Johnny Got His Gun about a, a war veteran who's lost all his limbs, can't move, can only speak by like moving his head or something and uh, how he's trapped like that. And the song actually really evokes that. It was one of my favorite songs in the early 90s when I used to play a lot of guitar, you know, that solo. And, Anyways, the idea of that emotional imagery, that visceral imagery of being trapped but unable to speak, again, evokes this idea of CPR awareness. 
Um, it also means safety for frontline healthcare staff. So if they're thrashing and punching because they're feeling this, how can we keep our staff safe? It's probably a question of sedation. So that being said, I want you to leave your comments. I'll try to put links to some of these articles. Um, one of them is behind, you know, it's a typical, the case report is behind a paywall. I had my wife pull it for me from her Stanford stuff, but I'll put at least a link to the, the paywalled article. And uh, I want you to tell me in the comments what your thoughts are. Have you experienced this as a frontline provider? I haven't been able to read them because I want to focus on talking about the story, but I'll go through and look at these comments and others will too. It's not just me sitting here trying to fake teach you stuff, guys. It's about you teaching each other in the comment section. And pretty soon Facebook's gonna allow upvoting of comments, so you'll start to see the most educational comments percolate to the top. That being said, I am deeply appreciated you're spending your time with me tonight. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you. If you're watching this here on YouTube or on Facebook, do me a favor and hit share, leave a comment. That helps us a lot to grow the platform and spread the word. And thanks for all you do. We out. Peace.